Hello, this is David Hall, and it is my pleasure to welcome you all to day three of a series of IoT conference tracks within the IoT Days online event presented by the IoT M2M Council. The topic for track two today is Cloud Platforms in IIoT and is sponsored by Nimblelink. You can see the full schedule in the resources section of your interface. Before we begin, we wanted to cover a few housekeeping items. At the bottom of your screen are multiple application widgets that you can use. All of these widgets are resizable and movable, so feel free to move them around to get the most out of your desktop space. You can expand your slide area or maximize it to full screen by clicking on the arrows in the top right corner. If your slides are delayed, pushing F5 to uh, refresh your page um, will sometimes uh, sync things back up. Uh, you can find additional answers to some common technical issues located in the help widget at the bottom of your screen. An on-demand version of the webcast will be available later today and can be accessed using the same audience link that was sent to you earlier. Now it is my pleasure to introduce uh, Keith Kreischer, the, direct, the Executive Director for the IMC. Keith, take it away. Thanks so much, Dave, and, and thanks to everyone for being here. Uh, our speakers, our, our audience, uh, hoping everyone attending is keeping safe and well in these uh, challenging times. Uh, yeah, welcome to this uh, uh, online conference track, uh, 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 Cloud and Platforms in IIoT, uh, brought to you by uh, the IoT m Council Council uh, and uh, Beecham Research, uh, AV System, and um, uh, Transforma Insights. Uh, um, uh, my name is Keith Kreischer. I'm the Executive Director of the IMC. Uh, we've got a great panel for this afternoon. And I'll be, uh, begin introducing our speakers in just a moment, but uh, first I'd like to take two minutes to introduce the IMC for those on the call that may not know us. Uh, the IMC as a group started in, in 2014 when a fairly eclectic group of IoT solutions providers, a combination of big telcos, MDNOs, providers of hardware and software, got together to form a trade association for the IoT sector. The group consensus was that we did not want to be a technical standards body nor a test bed organization. Plenty of good people working on those issues, and they are important. Uh, but we see those groups as essentially vendors talking amongst themselves, and we wanted to learn more about people that buy IoT stuff. And by that I mean enterprise users, product makers and uh, designers, apps developers that buy connectivity hardware and software to connect devices in the field. What do these people look like? What did they need, and how could we help them? So we started putting out content, uh, pretty much anything we could get our hands on, uh, white papers, use cases, blogs, newsletters. And we didn't ask people that wanted access to the content to pay us anything, but we did ask them to self-identify as buyers, not sellers, to join our organization as adopter members and give us permission to talk to them, and, crucially, to give us fairly extensive tabulatable demographic information. That whole effort turned out to be much more successful than we could have hoped, the IMC today has 25,000 rank-and-file adopter members from around the globe. They cover 24 different vertical markets, everything from automotive manufacturing to building and construction to retail point-of-sale. We get 200 new members weekly, and they come to us uh, inbound. We don't recruit. Uh, we do curate our, our member roles to keep them at around 25,000. And we look at our adopter membership as the largest market se segmentation study ever conducted for the IoT. Uh, the IMC board now includes some of the largest companies in the industry, AWS, HPE, Tata, and Vodafone, but also smaller influential service providers. And we see ourselves as an IoT accelerator. Our mission is bringing together buyers and sellers to expand the adoption of IoT technology for the common good. And we look at today's webinar on uh, cloud and platform in the IIoT as exactly in keeping with that mission. Uh, as for today's you know, sort of housekeeping, uh, we do encourage you to submit questions during the presentations. And we will address those at the end of our sessions uh, if we get the chance. Uh, if we don't get the chance, never fear. Uh, your questions will be uh, saved and, and provided to the presenters, and they will be able to get back to you after the live session. We will have a record of that question associated with the registration. Uh, and with that, um, I will introduce our first speaker today, uh, uh, Robin Duke Willie, uh, CEO of Beecham Research, uh, who will give us a talk on private cellular networks. Robin's best, uh, one of the best known and most respected names in the end-to-end -end communication sector. 
with over 20 years of experience as an analyst and consultant in telecom. Uh, Beecham, Beecham Research combines successful business experience and extensive analysis expertise in both research and consulting practices. The company operates globally and has research partners in many parts of the world. Good morning, my good friend, Robin. Good morning, Keith. Take us away. Thanks very much. Okay, well, I'll uh, just uh, move to my first slide. So um, I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, private cellular networking. Uh, it's really aimed at those who uh, perhaps are not yet considering uh, private cellular networking. It's, uh, it's a pretty hot area right now, and, uh, and we think that over the next few years it's going to get uh, even hotter. And uh, these are just a few slides to give you some sort of idea as to why we think that. So uh, the first slide is, uh, is a general slide. It's really just to show cellular IoT market growth. It's not specific to private. It's, uh, it's public, uh, it, it's public uh, cellular. And uh, the overall um, compound uh, growth rate is uh, over 30% in terms of uh, numbers of connections. Uh, uh, obviously, revenue would be a different uh, issue, but that depends on... Uh, individual charging and stuff like that so uh, we look at uh, we look at it in terms of um, absolute numbers of installed base of, uh, of connections um, covid uh, impact uh, on this growth is, is limited so far um, of course that might change but uh, what we tended to find in, in the past with uh, for example the financial crisis in 2008 is that if there was a slowdown the following year then it was, made, it was more than made up uh, the, the year after. So, uh, in fact, the long-term growth of, uh, of IoT uh, connections is pretty stable. Um, and uh, this slide shows, it's a composite, really. It shows uh, three, three parts, high bandwidth, which is uh, 4G, 5G, uh, 2G, 3G legacy, and low bandwidth, uh, MBIoT and uh, LTEM. Uh, of which um, the high bandwidth is in, is in high growth. Uh, so this is uh, uh, high bandwidth uh, applications of uh, ver uh, an increasing variety. Uh, legacy, uh, 2G, 3G, is, uh, is flat or, uh, or tailing off. And, and low bandwidth is, is also in high growth. So the fact that the overall market is growing at uh, greater than 30% shows uh, just how quickly this, this market is, is growing. Uh, bearing in mind that the legacy part is, is, is flat. Um, 4G LTE uh, technology is, uh, is mature, uh, flexible, and, uh, and reducing in cost. Um, 5G, still in the early stages of 5G, so the cost is quite high uh, and will be for IoT for the next few years. Uh, but uh, there are going to be certainly a lot of uh, use case uh, opportunities. <coughs> Turning to... Um, on-site use of connectivity technologies. Uh, we did a survey um, a little while ago now, but uh, this shows uh, some of the results of that. Um, and we showed um, Wi-Fi uh, as being, uh, th this is for use for uh, IoT uh, applications. And we showed that uh, Wi-Fi is, is by far the, uh, the, the greatest penetration uh, on-site, uh, 86%, uh, followed by uh, cellular, but uh, most of that is, uh, is, is used via uh, public networks, uh, not uh, necessarily um, uh, private networking. Um, Bluetooth uh, is, of course, short-range technology, um, and uh, we wanted to know just how, how, how much that was being used uh, in different um, uh, sectors. Uh, so it's, it, it appears pretty high. And then LoRa and then Sigfox. Uh, also being used uh, increasingly. And, of course, those are relatively new technologies, so they're, they're gaining ground uh, quickly um, now in, in, in the marketplace. So that uh, gives an idea that uh, you know, Wi-Fi is uh, still very important uh, for uh, on-site use. And um, we then asked a few more questions, which is like um, uh, specifically about use of Wi-Fi. So... Um, does it need to operate uh, outdoors? Uh, and 59% um, of respondents uh, said that, yes, that was true in their case. And then, if so, does that present difficulties? And uh, more than half of those, 56% of those, said that it did present difficulties. 
And this is a known issue with, with Wi-Fi, that uh, it, it's a bit prone to atmospheric conditions, um, and uh, you know, it, it, it is, it is uh, affected by weather conditions. So um, also, does it need to connect with, um, or does your, does your network need to connect with uh, moving vehicles? 63% uh, said yes. So there could be uh, uh, vehicles of different types on sites. There could be um, uh, other movable objects uh, uh, on site. And there needs to be uh, continual tracking uh, of those typically uh, on a site. The site could be pretty large, could be a port or something like that. So uh, there's, a, there's a need to, uh, to keep uh, regular attention to, to where things are. And um, if so, uh, of those... Um, uh, 63%, uh, does it sometimes uh, lose the connection uh, using Wi-Fi? And in 94% of the cases, uh, they agreed that that, that, that uh, can happen and does happen. Um, and then do you consider um, uh, Wi-Fi to be secure? Uh, well, 70% uh, thought that it was secure. Uh, now, th th you might think that that's quite high, but actually that's not very high when you think... Uh, but actually what you need is 100% security, so um, it's relatively low. Um, are there blind spots uh, on the site? Um, and 54% uh, said that there were blind spots, there were areas where they couldn't get signal, and they might need to uh, in, in, for particular applications. <coughs> um, and are there interference problems? Uh, and again, uh, half of them, 50%, said that there were. So. Yeah, although Wi-Fi is, is the first choice for uh, on-site uh, IoT applications, um, with, with, with IoT uh, use increasingly becoming uh, mission critical, uh, it's becoming more central to uh, operational activities uh, on-site. <coughs> Excuse me. Wi-Fi does have limitations. Um, so uh, just to summarize, uh, operating outdoors, uh, full-site coverage, uh, security, uh, moving devices um, on-site, but then there's also the issue of roaming uh, between on-site and off-site, which of course is not something that Wi-Fi can do at all. So um, for IoT use to continue its strong growth within the enterprise, uh, we believe that uh, uh, the market can no longer rely so heavily on, on Wi-Fi, but it's reaching its, uh, its peak of um, uh, opportunity, if you like. I'll talk a little bit more about Wi-Fi 6 in a short time. Um, so why PCN for um, uh, enterprise IoT? PCN being private cellular networking. Um, well, the small cell market uh, has been operating for many years. By small cell, I mean small uh, site-based uh, cells. Uh, and it's been operating for, for many years with a voice orientation, um, not so much a data orientation. Uh, and that's because uh, legacy uh, 2G and 3G uh, are not optimal for uh, IoT, whereas 4G and 5G are particularly suited to, uh, to IoT. Um, so there's a big changeover in terms of the uh, technology. Um, and um, 4G LTE introduces uh, high bandwidth and uh, a narrow band. So at the top end, you know, and also at the bottom end. Uh, so it's not just a limited um, uh, range of uh, uh, data rate uh, opportunities, uh, uh, as is particularly found with 2G, for example, uh, because there's, there's high bandwidth and then there's lower bandwidth than, uh, than 2G offers. So more applications as a result of that uh, can now be served in the future by LTE than uh, uh, the previous technologies have been able to do. And, of course, uh, 5G takes that even further. So um, the ROI, the return on investment for a licensed uh, LTE, using licensed LTE on a, on a private site, um, usually requires uh, voice to be included. Um, and then there's, there's CapEx versus OpEx. Um, uh, for on-site use, uh, there is uh, no um, uh, MNO subscriptions, of course. It's, uh, it's all part of the, uh, the site cost. Um, and, uh, and also, uh, a private network is under local management control. There's no dependence on uh, th a third party. Uh, so if there are uh, need for, for making uh, quick changes, 
uh, in the system. It can be done straight away by the uh, admin team uh, in the local uh, in the local company. Uh, and of course, uh, uh, quite importantly for uh, some applications, the data remains on premise. Uh, there is no prospect, uh, or there, it, for, for some applications, it's really important that the uh, that the data does not go off site. There is uh, the threat of um, uh, um, industrial espionage, for example, and uh, there is also privacy issues, uh, for example, for uh, healthcare records and so forth. Uh, if those things go off site. So um, uh, there's a, a, an increasing um, awareness of the, uh, the need for uh, data to, to, to remain uh, on premise. And um, then uh, there's local coverage, uh, of course, in the PCN designed to meet uh, on site needs. Uh, so, specifically, uh, what's required on that site. And then lastly, uh, there's uh, the whole issue of, uh, of security and uh, increasing that security. Uh, as I say, beyond that 70% that, uh, that Wi-Fi offers. Uh, so a cellular uh, type of approach uh, is inherently uh, more secure than, than a Wi-Fi approach, um, and uh, we, can, we can see that uh, being uh, increasingly important uh, uh, over time. So then uh, looking at uh, some of the typical applications, uh, typical sites uh, that uh, uh, PCNs can be used for, uh, there's a large number. This is mining, um, large retail event sites and stadia, uh, oil and gas, uh, military bases, uh, power generation, transport venues, airports and ports, uh, hospitals and labs, quarries, uh, water utilities, university campuses, warehouses, industrial and manufacturing. Uh, not mentioned there is agriculture, which is another big area to uh, to include. So there's, um, there's a lot of... Um, potential uh, for use of, uh, of private networking in those types of, uh, of sectors, uh, those types of application areas. So um, if you are uh, in those areas, then uh, we think that it's something that you, uh, you should be looking at. Um, and then uh, taking that a little bit further, uh, we, uh, we have uh, the number of uh, uh, sites worldwide for uh, each of these segments. Um, and this is a worldwide average. Uh, obviously, it varies by region, um, but uh, and, and indeed by country. Uh, but uh, this is a, an, an, a sort of average uh, for, uh, for for worldwide. And this is number of um, sites. It's not uh, individual connections. Obviously, the uh, situation looks a little bit different if you look at it in terms of numbers of connections per site rather than uh, sites. Um, some of these sites. Uh, are very large, um, so airports, uh, ports, mining, for example, uh, can cover a very large uh, area. Um, some uh, of those may be uh, lightly um, uh, populated with uh, with connections. Some of them may be uh, quite densely den densely uh, covered by uh, by connections. But it's the it's the numbers of connections that are really the uh, uh, the fundamental um, requirement there. But um, it's interesting to note, I think, that uh, industrial and uh, manufacturing represents more than half of the uh, uh, numbers of sites that uh, could usefully use uh, PCN uh, worldwide. Uh, and that's, that's followed then by uh, warehousing. And uh, warehousing includes logistics and uh, automated uh, systems like that. So there's uh, quite a lot going on in that space uh, right now. Uh, obviously, uh, the need for deliveries and uh, Streamlining of, um, of of logistics is a, is a is a very hot topic at the moment, uh, and uh, and that's a, a key area for um, for um, uh, PCNs. Uh, looking a little bit further down, we've got hospitals and, and, and labs. Um, that 2.8 percent um, looks uh, pretty pretty low, but in fact it's actually uh, quite a lot because uh, hospitals are very densely populated with numbers of connections. Um, and then transport venues, uh, airports and ports, for example, uh, further down, and so forth. So you get an idea of uh, the, uh, the diversity of uh, different spaces that uh, a PCN network can be used in. And then there's the, uh, the use of them, uh, the technology. Um, so um, there can be a, a private network um, that is uh, over a, a fairly extensive area, or there could be um, a, a a private area within a public net network uh, that is uh, 
uh, just a, a relatively small um, area. And then there is the uh, possibility of roaming between uh, public networks and private networks. Uh, and that's going to become increasingly important, we think, uh, over the next uh, few years as, the, uh, as this part of the market uh, development develops. It requires um, developments of the software, the, uh, the control software in the uh, EPCs. Um, and it's used uh, particularly in, uh, in ports, uh, mining operations, airports, things like that, where, for example, um, trucks are loaded up uh, on site and they uh, need to be part of the private network. And then, of course, uh, they go outside of the, 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 uh, the, uh, the private site for deliveries uh, and they need to be on the public network. And the, uh, the same data needs to be collected from them when they're in the public space compared with the private space and so forth. So, uh, yeah, a lot, of, a lot of work needs to be done uh, in that area. So then uh, looking at uh, current uh, connectivity options, um, this is a slide from uh, Nokia, in fact, which uh, looks at different uh, uh, wireless technologies and the, um, the key plus points, if you like, and the potential negatives uh, from all of those. Um, the, the point to make about all of these is that for uh, each of these uh, challenges, security, reliability, high data rates, uh, low latency, uh, predictable performance, coverage, uh, being able to work uh, with a low power wide area, uh, mobile use and voice. Cellular uh, covers all of those. So uh, cellular covers all of them, but all of the uh, other technologies uh, are only um, uh, evident in, in some of them. Um, now, I said I'd say a little bit more about Wi-Fi 6. Wi-Fi 6 is... Uh, an important uh, enhancement of, of Wi-Fi. Uh, it's at the uh, 802.11ax um, uh, specification. Um, and with use in the uh, 6 gigahertz unlicensed uh, band, it increases the spectrum available uh, four times. It goes up from 400 megahertz to 1600 megahertz, which is a big increase in capacity. Uh, and it supports uh, more, so that's going to support uh, many more uh, Wi-Fi users uh, and significantly reduces congestion. Um, <coughs> provides limitations, though, for uh, mission-critical IoT applications uh, as before. So the, uh, the types of issues that I identified uh, earlier in that slide with the uh, survey users, uh, it doesn't actually reduce any of those issues. Uh, it, uh, it, it, it reduces the issues in, in, in other areas. So we don't think that Wi-Fi 6 is going to have a substantial impact on, uh, on PCN. Um, I'm going to skip this one. This is about CBRS in the US. Uh, you have the slides uh, which you can uh, take from the uh, web resources. Uh, you can download from that. And this explains more about uh, the CBRS and how that works and, uh, and everything like that. It's now been, a, would say, a huge success in its uh, opening phase uh, in, in the US market. And it's given uh, other countries um, a, a, a model, if you like, to look at how you can share spectrum uh, in an efficient way for different uses. Um, so, um, yeah, I'll leave that one to, uh, to one side. Just say a few words about Multifire. Multifire is uh, use of 4G LTE in unlicensed spectrum, uh, and it's not limited to a particular frequency band. So. For example, it's being used at 1.9 gigahertz in, uh, in Japan. Uh, that was launched in uh, January 2019 with a relatively small channel, which is now increasing. Um, and uh, there have you know, been trials at 5 gigahertz um, and uh, other frequencies uh, as well. So it's, uh, it's a family of, um, of frequency bands that uh, Multifier can be used in. But it's been quite slow to, uh, to get to market, uh, primarily, I think, because... Uh, Everybody's been focusing on 5G and getting that to market. Um, but um, 5 gigahertz modems from uh, Nokia are, are due to be launched uh, shortly. So we'll see uh, some activity in the multifire area, I think, pretty soon. Um, another slide from uh, Nokia, and I'm not going to talk about this in, uh, in detail, but um, this shows just how much activity there is worldwide at the moment in opening up the um, spectrum for... Uh, PCN uh, opportunities, uh, different countries, different solutions. Uh, there's licensed and unlicensed. Um, so it's quite a complex picture. But nevertheless, uh, when you're looking at it from a, 
an individual country point of view, and of course uh, an individual site is within an individual country, um, the, uh, uh, the, the opportunities are definitely increasing, and we can see uh, lots of potential uh, over the next few years for uh, more spectrum to become available for use by PCNs. So what is the business potential of uh, PCNs? Well, we believe that uh, we're looking at an uh, enterprise IoT opportunity of over uh, $30 billion by uh, 2025. Uh, it's particularly attractive for uh, large sites, physically large sites. Um, PCN requires a higher concentration of uh, gateways and routers. Um, that's how you um, uh, organize the applications uh, on site, typically with uh, gateways as hubs and then uh, a number of devices attached to those gateways. Um, so that means uh, a high growth opportunity uh, for uh, gateways and routers. Um, and we believe that means that it will become a significant element of the uh, enterprise uh, IoT market. Um, higher concentration also of uh, cellular modules for both broadband and narrowband, potentially a high use of, uh, of narrowband. And uh, if you want to get more information, uh, then uh, we have a, a dedicated uh, web address uh, for uh, further information, PCN at beachandresearch.com, um, and uh, we are continuing our research in this area. So uh, through that um, contact, uh, we can update you on uh, new reports and new information that uh, we're making available uh, as we go along. So uh, thanks very much. That's my presentation. Thank you, Ron. Hey, terrific stuff, and certainly topical. Uh, there's no doubt that uh, PCNs are a uh, uh, a very interesting subject and, and something that's, uh, uh, that's, that's gained a lot of momentum uh, in the last couple of months. Uh, what percentage of PCN deployments do you uh, reckon will be 4G versus 5G? Well, that's interesting. Um, so uh, 4G, of course, in the, in the short term will, will dominate because uh, uh, of the cost issue for, uh, for 5G. And you can see that uh, 4G is very much a stepping stone towards uh, 5G, 5G uh, will be uh, become increasingly attractive in uh, two to three years' time, particularly for uh, intensive operations such as manufacturing. Uh, there's a lot of interest in 5G private networking for uh, manufacturing environments with uh, high, high levels of automation where uh, latency is a particular issue and you, mean, you need to have very, very, very small latency. Um, so, you know, so it's... It, it's like 95 to 100% at the moment for, uh, for 4G, but uh, I would say that in five years' time, it will be uh, the new ones uh, will be uh, moving, moving more towards uh, 5G. So, but it will take a while to actually get to 5G. And hey, I need a quick answer to this one. <laughs> okay. Do you reckon Wi-Fi 6 will reduce demand for PCN? No, I don't. I mean, as I mentioned uh, just now, um, most of what Wi-Fi 6 offers is actually uh, somewhat um, different to the requirements for uh, mission-critical IoT applications. Um, it provides uh, much more uh, bandwidth, uh, which is really good for having uh, you know, use of laptops and uh, you know, streaming services and video and stuff like that uh, for users. But it's not really uh, going to help uh, IoT applications. So I think that uh, the two are going to progress side by side, and we're going to see uh, much more use of Wi-Fi 6, of course, on site. But I think that we're going to, in parallel, see uh, much more use of PCNs, 4G, and then 5G. Terrific. Hey, uh, learned a lot. Thanks so much. And um, with that, we are right up against it. So I've got to, I've got to jump to our next presentation, our next speaker. Robin, of course, was a sort of a guest speaker here this morning t talking about uh, uh, personal cellular networks. Uh, now we shift to uh, discussion of cloud and platforms. And joining us is William Yan, who's president of America's AV System, uh, a passionate tech industry veteran. William played key executive roles in both emerging and well-established companies on a global scale, culminating at C-level positions with full P&L. Uh, in his career, uh, William has built and managed a global team of marketing, sales, business development, and professional services working extensively with telecom and broadband service providers, network operations, engineering and architectures, and custom care teams. William has built a core domain expertise in the telecom slash broadband network management, OSS, BSS, and service management platforms. 
William, good morning. Good afternoon, as it were. Good morning. Thank you, Keith. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, uh, wherever you are. Thank you for joining us. Uh, this uh, virtual conference being held in the middle of this uh, COVID-19 pandemic. So I uh, aligned my discussion, uh, focused on business resiliency or business continuity through the application of data orchestration as applied in industrial IoT. Hello, everyone. My name is William Yan. I'm with AV System. First, a few key, uh, key quick words about AV System. We are on the technology side of uh, IoT. We provide a device and data management platform for service providers, that's your telcos, broadband service providers, enterprises, typically large cross-country multinational enterprises, and OEMs. OEMs, these uh, cheap set of vendors, uh, module device manufacturers, and device uh, integrators. Speaking of devices, uh, in our portfolio, a key foundation of what we do is device management. We manage device lifecycle from device onboarding, interrupt testing, to remote monitoring, diagnostics, reporting, perform uh, firmware updates, security patch updates, provision the device, the entire life cycle of managing the device. On top of the devices is our data integration platform, which uh, correlates data from various sources, different systems, to yield insights for decision-making assistance. So if you look at AV system Coyote IoT, it is a device management and data integration suite of applications. Today, I also, uh, I've also brought with me a specific use case in terms of uh, a service, a location-based service. Since we're in the middle of fighting this uh, COVID-19 pandemic, very relevant for today's discussion, applying IoT technologies, which is track and trace, pinpointing location of events, personnel, doing asset monitoring, uh, space optimization. A key focus of that uh, application is uh, safety, employee safety, equipment safety, as in the manufacturing process. Speaking of with, which, we are facing, faced with a lot of challenges. So uh, it's no doubt you would be agree, you would agree with me that industrial IoT has changed everything and uh, has uh, forced us to reimagine business as is. In our opinion, if anything, the COVID-19 pandemic has actually accelerated that transformation. Even though some projects or certain projects being postponed or being held up due to the lack of physical access. The challenges we're faced with are a multitude as of now. So how do you stay connected while we are physically distanced? How to manage capacity and resources while your supply chain got disrupted or held up? How to optimize your operations while your employees' very personal safety and health are called into question? How to access data while they are more dispersed now? So connect and optimize is no longer a luxury, but a necessity. So here brings me up to IIoT, Industrial IoT, or Industrial 4.0. What is the IIoT about? It's all about connected, connecting devices and assets in the manufacturing process, as well as how you operate your business. It's about Lightweight sensors, applying the sensors to track and trace, collecting data, provide insight to aid your decision making. It's about convergence, convergence of information systems with your operational technology. It's about automation, it's really automating decision making from data collection to analysis to compute and executing commands. 
So uh, IoT is all focused on operational efficiency and increased productivity. Now, in the middle of this pandemic, we have to add, it really focused on business resiliency and continuity. How does data orchestration apply in this regard? So let's take a closer look at data orchestration. Data orchestration is all about crawling data from various sources, devices, systems into a meaningful data set to aid insight, to aid decision making. With open API, it allows integration of internal system data, departments, uh, machines, uh, work groups, but also expanding to external supply chain partners, your point of sales systems, and your customer data. Now you may ask, what are these uh, data you're talking about? So we're talking about contextual data as in machine data from sensors, from instruments in your manufacturing shop floor, your business data from your business system, ERP, CRM, your MRO, maintenance repair op optimization platforms, your wearables, tracking devices, your loca location data, your environmental data. All of these are integrated to aid decision making to process events and decisions. So a closer look at data orchestration platform. First and foremost, you integrate collecting the data from various sources. You process the data and the event but with a goal in mind, which is supporting your use case, be it in smart building management, smart factory management, in your supply chain transportation systems. Your business driver ought to be either cost cutting or increase revenue stream. So here's an example of tracking, aggregating data, presenting the data in a meaningful way to the end user. And this is an example of uh, temperature and uh, humidity levels over a certain time threshold. So data orchestration is also about performing analysis on the fly in real time. And being able to alert anomalies is all about management by exception. On the top chart, it shows the doors. The hours is open, the hours is locked, alerting any abnormal activities. The bottom of the chart shows a cold chain refrigerated truck in terms of temperature, in terms of moisture levels, and uh, so on and so forth. The example I brought with me today in terms of a specific uh, services as in Vintify uh, from our portfolio allows you to identify points of congestion. For example, you present the data in a heat map fashion or you pinpoint a specific location in the shop floor in your workshop where the activities are, where, where's the congregations happening. And you're able also to display the data by different demarcation zones. So we're tracking activities, we're tracking the process over a time threshold. So the business time of the day, so you can uh, plan and allocate human resources or plan your activities accordingly. Most relevant uh, application uh, as we speak right now is contact tracing. Identify people with higher risk of infection, being able to correlate data with voluntary health information shared with you. It's all about connect, using data, and the aid of decision making. And that brings me up to the first of two polling questions I've prepared for this audience today. Uh, we're going to display your um, your response uh, in aggregate, so your identity's uh, privacy is being protected. 
uh, if you uh, wouldn't mind to participate in this uh, short survey, two questions. The first one, how did your organization implement its data platform? A, I guess you click on the little bubble to the left, by a third-party commercial vendor, B, built in-house by your own IT department, don't have one, still data silos, but planning it now. Or the next one, don't have one, probably won't have one for the next 12 months. Or anything else, other. So you have about 30 seconds uh, to submit your answer. And we're going to display it in aggregate uh, your response to share with the audience. I am going to, uh, all right, interesting, very interesting. Uh, <clears throat> I see the red, uh, a quarter, almost a third of us here and do not have a data platform and don't even have a plan for the next 12 months. Uh, very interesting. And thank you for your participation. Uh, I shall move on and comment, maybe if I have time allows, I'll comment back uh, on this uh, later on. So we uh, discussed data, data integration. The data all comes from the tracking devices. So let's review what are the tasks or steps in terms of getting the device ready in, in what we call device life cycle management. You have a device inventory, and you can do onboard testing, interop testing, configure the device, bootstrap the device, meaning authenticate. So as we say, garbage in, garbage out. You've got to have a valid device to yield valid data. Register the device, perform firmware updates, perform security patches, provision and management, and also the whole loop, retire the device back to inventory. How do you do all of these in a large scale, you might ask? Since I got legacy devices, I got new sensors, I'm dealing with a dozen uh, providers or vendors, uh, is there a standard for me to, to use, to utilize, in order to uh, do uh, updates on a massive scale instead of manually one by one? There are a number of technologies with one fast emerging of being adopted, initiated by uh, Open Mobile Alliance, Omar Specworks, is called Lightweight Machine-to-Machine -machine Device Management Protocol. It is designed specifically for managing constrained devices, which is your sensors, actuators, low memory, low power, connected through constrained networks, uh, like low power, uh, wide area network, in the cellular space, as the previous uh, speaker mentioned, you got narrowband IoT or your cellular uh, LTEM uh, to private networks like LoRa, uh, LoRaWAN or uh, Sigfox, even your Wi-Fi or your Bluetooth low energy network. So what is uh, Lightweight MKM do? It's a simple, low footprint, low bandwidth uh, consumption. It provides a well-defined objects, and uh, you can also discover the data models consistently. And it has comes with it a state-of-the-art security mechanism. It performs uh, uh, firmware updates over the air or software updates over the air uh, on a massive scale. And it applies to cellular or satellite or the other uh, low power networks, as I mentioned already, for both IP or non-IP data delivery. So that's uh, Lightweight M2M. How do you get help? Where do you start? If you ask, you know, my device, is it Lightweight M2M compliant? Or how do I know how to get it be able to support Lightweight M2M? Uh, first, let's review the core functionalities it does. So bootstrapping, 
remote control, configuration, and connectivity management, reporting, analysis, so on and so forth. There are a number of tools on the device client side for firmware development, for support, and uh, I've just brought with me uh, AV system, Andre, like with m SDK, has both an open source version as well as, as a commercial version. It provides a reference implementation. It supports the latest lightweight M2M uh, release. It works across a multitude of uh, operating systems. But it's been around for five years now, so it's tested already. Where do you get help if you want to start your uh, today? Uh, <clears throat> That's Omar Stackworks. Uh, it's a large organization with many uh, enterprises supporting it, including AT&T, Ericsson. And we are certainly a major contributor. On the client side, you got a few tools here, including our own day. Uh, we discussed orchestration. Discussed, we started with device, data, integration, and intelligence. It all started from the very bottom with devices. Then you move up to device management performing all these functions and uh, doing open API integration with your back office ERP or CRM, performing analytics, performing reporting, alerting functions. So which now that brings me to the second of my two polling questions, uh, which is which of the following best describes your company's most pressing IoT initiative? You can pick a, a more than one if they apply. Uh, you got about uh, 35, uh, 40 seconds to answer, and we will display the results. So choose an IoT. You are busy choosing an IoT connectivity partner. You are working on planning and implementing data uh, scheme, data platform. You are learning about standards to design future-proof IoT systems, or you are hiring data scientists and deploying visualization tools. Well, current pandemic put IoT data product on hold, or current pandemic put uh, your IoT data product on steroid. Urgency of delivery, or all of the above, or none of the above. So you got another 20, 30 seconds for me to display the results. Okay, let's take a look at uh, how you voted. All right, about 20% of you guys choose a connectivity partner. All right, that's where most companies start an IoT project. Then planning implementing data harmonization platform. That's really encouraging. Almost half, that's 40, a whopping 45% of the audience, you are focusing on this area where data integration, data orchestration is going to aid your business decision making. Okay, let's show them down to see standards. Interesting, it's about the same of what's the impact of the pandemic uh, on your IoT project. Thank you for your participation, and uh, this is an interesting result, and uh, I really appreciate your, uh, your voting here. Uh, at AV System, we work with a multitude of industries and enterprises, from oil and gas company, and to a smart city, smart building, smart factory, and we applied IoT technology in terms of uh, doing device management, data orchestration, collecting telemetry data, in terms of the temperature, pressure, moisture levels, whatever you need to track to support your business. So that's all I prepared today for uh, our discussion. And thank you for your participation. And here's my contact information for you to reach out to your AV system or myself. Thanks again for your participation. Well, Back thank to you, Keith. 
Thank, thank you for your time and, and, and some interesting results to those surveys. I, I, uh, I want to go back and look at those myself and uh, give that some thought. Uh, Very good. Thank you. With that, uh, we will, uh, uh, and, and thanks again, William and AV System. With that, uh, our next presentation will begin in approximately four minutes. We'll have uh, Jim Morsh, founding partner at Transform Insights, talking to us about how to choose an IMT platform. And with then, we've got just a few moments uh, before we're five minutes before the hour to start time for our next uh, presentation. Uh, that presentation comes to us from Jim Morsh, who's founding partner of Transform Insights. Uh, Jim is a respected digital transformation and Internet of Things industry expert with over 20 years of experience in strategy consulting, operations management, and telecoms research. Previously, he was a founder and the chief research officer 
at Machina Research, a leading IoT analyst firm, which was acquired by Gartner in 2016. Jim's currently co-chair of the Digital Transformation Working Group of the Industrial Internet Consortium. Additionally, he is a member of the advisory boards for a number of digital transformation industry conferences and is a member of the Global Advisory Board of the IET's Future Technology Panel. Uh, Jim Morish, welcome. I can't hear you, Jim. Hello? Yeah, there you go. <laughs> oh, yeah, sorry, the audio just went dead there, right on cue. Thank you for the introduction, Keith. Thank you. Um, Right. Perfect, right up to that point. Okay, I'll take it away. Um, so thank you for the introduction. Uh, this is a presentation on how to choose an IoT platform, um, and I will take you. Th I will take you through a quick agenda. Um, so I'm going to do a quick introduction to uh, Transformer Insights. Um, I'm going to talk a little about IoT platforms from a generic perspective. I'm going to talk about the diversity of IoT, because I think it's very important to understand that before we think about how to select an IoT platform. Then we're going to discuss how to go about selecting an IoT platform, followed by some conclusions. So um, introducing Transformer Insights in 30 seconds. We are a new technology research firm, industry analyst firm. We do things like uh, reports on, on uh, IoT space and various digital transformation technologies, which you can see along the bottom of this slide here. Uh, we do forecasts and consulting and profile vendors in the space, et cetera. Um, it's a new company, but as Keith mentioned, uh, myself and Matt Hass and the two founders are old hands because we previously founded McKenna Research, which we sold to Gartner. So we've been in the space for a while. Um, this is our graphic, which illustrates all of the aspects of digital tra transformation that we, ca we cover. I'm not going to go through that in detail now, uh, but you can find a, a copy of that on our, on our website landing page if you want to have a look through the detail. Um, next, generic perspective on IoT platforms. Um, and what I have here is I, I just have a, a, a graphic illustrating the range of platforms that, 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 that are out there and that can impact I'm going to support IoT applications. Um, so probably starting in the center of this diagram, um, application enablement, that's the, that's the one that tends to come to the top of people's minds when they first think about IoT platforms. That, that's you know, focused on central orchestration, um, often includes and expands to include other, you know, other of the, the fact platform functions which are identified on this slide. Um, quite often there's device management where necessary for specific devices. Um, underpinning of this, of course, is connectivity enablement, which supports the provision of connectivity. And of course, there are actually connectivity platforms as well, which you know, go the next step and provide that connectivity. Um, off to the side, um, you, or just up, up the top in the blue, you've got things like business rules, uh, platforms, so ITTT, if this, then that. Um, you know, you know, building logic on top of the uh, on top of the information that comes into a platform, and of course, enterprise applications and integration into uh, a, a, a wider organisation. Um, and off the side, you've got a, a range of niche uh, and specialist platforms, things like you know to support artificial intelligence or machine learning or data trading or databases, etc. So this is a fairly generic view of of the of the type of platforms that there are out there to support IoT applications. Um, the rest of this presentation principally applies to AEPs, application enablement platforms, um, but it's relevant to other platforms too. Um, so a fairly generic approach to selecting, uh, to selecting a platform might be to, to look at a two by two and pick the guys in the top right hand side. Um, you know, identify the platform with good capabilities, vision, or ability to execute, or whatever those criteria are. Connect your devices into that platform and the various data sources, and it'll all work out just fine. Um, and and that, is, that, is, that is definitely not the way to do it. Um, there's quite a lot more complexity under the hood. And that's what I'm going to talk through in these next few slides about you know, just how, just how div diverse IoT is. So it's worth spinning back a few steps um, and looking at the situation from, from a higher level and then coming back to platforms and understanding what the, what the differences are and how to go about, how to go about selecting them. So um, IoT encompasses a challenging diversity of data types and systems complexity. And what I'm going to show on this page, uh, on this slide, it will build over time. What I'm going to show is, is the extracts from a case study database that uh, we've built at Transformer Insights. So in there, we've got, um, well, we've got 
many hundreds um, of digital transformation projects, of which um, you know, more than 200 are IoT projects, and they're entered into our database, and we can search them. We've we've identified key parameters of these projects, and I'm going to just pull out a few of the um, uh, a few relevant criteria for platform selection on this page. So, firstly, um, in terms of in terms of looking at uh, IoT solutions and their requirements for on-device processing, um, you can see there's quite a wide, quite, quite a wide, wide, wide range there. So some applications require occasional processing, so alarms um, or, or you know, alarms or, or potentially you know, some require you know, complex high bandwidth real-time data streams and, and there's everything in between. So wide range of requirements, what happens on the device in the field. Um, real-time requirements, um, so 25 solutions that just require a daily batch sync. It's just it's non-time critical in, in information. It's batch synced back to a cloud and, and processed in a, in, a, in a platform. But 70% require rapid response to data. And that either requires a very rapid uh, connection to, to cloud processing or more likely um, uh, capabilities and analytics deployed at the edge or towards the edge uh, or potentially even um, a, a, a data ops type environment um, where, where you've, you've got multiple locations at the edge for, for processing information. So again, wide range of real-time requirements from daily batch sync to 75% to, to, you know, of applications requiring some level of rapid response to ingested data. In terms of what's happening in the field and the stability of what's happening in the field, um, the next chart is is, is stability of data model and analytics. Um, and it shows that 29% of solutions are, are, are just static. You configure them, they report over a number of years, and, and, and nothing really changes. But 70% require ongoing changes to what's happening in the field. And those could be new, different, or improved analytic capabilities um, as the solution involves. So it, again, you've got to manage those changes in the field and push analytic changes out to the field. Um, when the data actually gets to the back end and needs to be processed in the back end, again, some projects are, are really complex. So 32% of projects we found rely on you know, more than 10 different data types coming into the back end and being analyzed um, to, 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 to support the IoT solution in question. Um, complexity here is, of course, exponential with the number of data types. Um, some projects, 31% of projects, you know, require less than three data types to be processed in the back end. So you've got, a, 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 again, quite a different profile of complexity there. So if you just look at these things here in terms of on-device processing, what, what happens in the field, how quickly it has to happen, what changes in the field, and the variety of what happens in the back end, you, you, and, and, and you can see a very good distribution across all of these different categories, yet the message of this slide is there is no such thing as a standard IoT project. The requirements vary very much uh, and very widely. Um, and frankly, the closer you look, the more diverse IoT is. Um, and what I've got here and what I've profiled here is some of the complexity, um, uh, some complexity analysis of two different projects. One is a smart tractors project. Um, and this basically, um, th 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 this project involves uh, tractors in an agricultural set, setting um, being basically autonomously uh, driven um, around fields um, and, the, the, and, the, and the solution involves artificial intelligence to, to, to navigate around the field. Um, it involves you know, complex geopositioning, uh, human machine interface in terms of feeding back to, 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 to the driver or the operator of the vehicle, um, ex exactly what's going on, um, information about the field, you know, what fertilizers are needed, or, Grow, you know, the, the uh, growth rate of, of 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 crops and weeds and so on. So that's 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 quite a sophisticated solution um, in an in an agricultural context. Um, Second solution um, is a smart metering solution, um, and you know, obviously that involves um, you know, deployment of millions of devices, but in a single country. Um, 
And you know, it's, it's actually quite a simple application in terms of functionality, but obviously it has to be enterprise grade in terms of volumes. And if you actually look at the dimensions of complexity of these two projects, um, you know, they, they really are very different. So in terms of device count, it's the smart metering project that's much, much more complicated. Um, just managing that volume of devices in terms of remote con connectivity, that's, you know, again, smart metering is more complicated and the business operations impact is, is, is probably greater. Again, smart meeting. But when you get, come around to these, some of these other areas like human machine interface, artificial intelligence, data sharing between different providers and different vendors, um, the global scale and requirements to, to deploy across multiple countries, um, including you know, challenging uh, challenging markets um, and the actual functional complexity, you know, the smart tractors project is far more important. Solution stability, um, the, the smart tractors a solution would get uh, upgraded and refined over time. But then we get round to projected lifetime again you know, that, that's considerably more complex from a smart meeting perspective because that solution is going to have to be in place for 20 years or so. Um, and the project environment is probably more challenging as well um, in, terms of, in terms of manage to, 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 to cost and just overall scale and challenge of managing the project. So the closer you look, the more diverse it is. And those are two really quite diverse projects there. And of course, what that filters through to is very different procurement criteria. So if you want to support a smart tractor project, what you're looking for is capabilities in user interface, um, experience of agriculture, experience of edge computing, um, artificial intelligence, cellular connectivity, and agility, because that solution is going to be changed and refined over time. Um, if you're looking to procure to support a smart metering solution, what's going to be top of your mind is enterprise application integration, uh, knowledge of utilities, the utility space, knowledge of field operations, and ability to manage and support field operations, um, demonstrated ability to, to support regulatory compliance, um, communications technologies experience, probably more diverse range of communications technologies um, as well, and, and billing and rating capabilities. So. What, 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 those differences in the project, which I started to talk about in the previous slide, and where we drill down to individual projects here, they actually result in really different requirements from, from platforms and different requirements that we should be taken into a procurement exercise. And having gone through that background, I'm going, now going to talk about how you do select an IoT platform. So first thing to recognize here um, is that IoT platforms tend to be a support act, not the main event. Um, generally, it's not about the platform, it's about the enterprise that houses the platform. So enterprises have different strengths and weaknesses and different strategies. And fundamentally, um, an IoT platform exists to productize elements of solution offerings that are frequently reused. So what you've got is you've got an overall direction of travel and a, and a strategy of a company uh, which chooses to develop a platform to support that strategy. Um, and, and, and that platform is, is optimized and oriented and has strengths that support the overall strategy of the vendor that, that houses it. Um, and, 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 and that's the direction of logic. The direction of logic is from the dynamics of the company implying the capabilities of the platform. So the platform is a reflection of the capabilities and strategy of the vendor, not vice versa. Um, so for example, you could have a platform vendor that may have strengths in smart cities or in manufacturing or industry 4.0 or edge or media and content management. Um, and, and, and these can be quite different providers and they're all very valid propositions, but they might not all work for you, your requirements. Um, so what you need is someone who has done it, not someone who can do it. Uh, and that's, the, that's kind of a recurring theme, I think, when selecting a platform, um, is, is demonstrated capability of deploying what you need and what you want at scale. So how do you do that? Well, we've developed a four-step approach. Um, and the first thing to do is to look for vendors with matching solution and domain experience. So in terms of domain experience, um, you, you, you will have different platforms and different vendors and different providers who have, for instance, experience in agriculture or construction or health or manufacturing or, or, or a whole range of other sectors. Um, or they might have um, 
specialization in some particular solution, so fleet or smart buildings or supply chain or smart metering, et cetera. And of course, you will have um, vendors of IoT platforms and platform capabilities which specialize in the intersection of those. So somebody might specialize in supply chain for the healthcare, for healthcare markets um, or smart metering and utilities in utilities in environments. So you get, you, you get some quite optimized um, solutions for verticals and you, know, you may find a provider who offers exactly your solution in your industry and that would be a good, a good person to talk to clearly. A next level of consideration um, is to look for providers with relevant capabilities and context expertise. So just unpicking that a little bit, um, context expertise, somebody might know a lot about or be very experienced in uh, Industry 4.0 uh, or ERP integration uh, or servitization, etc. Um, alternatively, they could, and they could have some capabilities in Edge, AR, VR. AR, AI, physics-based modeling, et cetera, or a specialist in the intersection of these things. So, um, and, and that's the second level of consideration is that uh, capability and context um, uh, consideration. The next thing you have to do is check the positional and relationship match of potential vendors. So the positional match um, is comes down, I think, to scale, uh, the project scale, geographic scale, and right size turnover. And this is about matching providers. As an end user, you need to be on their radar. You need to be big enough to, to, to be noticed. Um, you also need to consider the scope, whether it's an isolated project or an ongoing relationship. And Next, you need to consider the relationship match. So consider providers that are already incumbent because you know how to work with them and they know you, um, or, or, or who are partners with incumbent vendors, and also adjacent capabilities. So you know, vendors that have capabilities in upstream processes uh, or can have a match with downstream requirements. And this is essentially about the fit between a vendor and an end user. And then you pull all that together. Um, and you know, essentially what we're saying in this, in this little scoring matrix is that you know, vendors with matching solution in industry and, and solution and industry expertise score highly. If there's no match there, then consider capability and context um, and adjust the positional and relationship match um, to, to, to refine that prioritization. And I will say that this framework isn't perfect, but it's a good start to get to the RFP stage for new adopters. Long term, and I'm running out of time here, so I'm going to have to go through this very quickly. Uh, but in the long term, what you need to do is, is, is migrate to a well-managed technology and environment. And, and basically, I'm going to run through the right-hand column here in terms of the, you know, the evolve um, position, which is having a list of approved technologies and providers being maintained, knowing how those technologies work together, um, understanding of standards and standards bodies, and a complete register of assets and associated metadata. So that's the long-term vision you're looking at, um, and, and you should consider any individual pa platform partnership in that context, in the context of an overall journey supported by a strategy. So moving to conclusions. Um, conclusions. Uh, I, 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 IoT is diverse, really diverse, um, and I think that just looking at a distribution and picking the guys who are top right in a in a two by two matrix doesn't do, 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 isn't revealing. Um, what you need to do is recognise that platforms are a support act, and the capabilities tend to reflect the focus areas and competencies the vendors that offer those platforms. And then you have to look, and then caveat emptor, you have to look for those providers who have done something and demonstrated their ability to deploy at scale, rather than those who say they can. And you have to plan for the future. So you have to dovetail your tactical next moves into a long-term vision of what your technical strategy will look like. And with that, hopefully, I'm almost exactly on time. Well, you are on time. That's terrific. <laughs> Jim, thanks so much. Really appreciate you uh, being here. And certainly uh, 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 was, for me personally, an educational experience. I, 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 I've got to ask this question because you went into uh, diversity of IT and the subordination of platforms, uh, uh, you know, different data types, heterogeneous data types. I recently talked to a whole group of OEMs in the uh, you know, a, a part of it is certainly heavy machinery. A part of that was agricultural tractors, which was, of course, one of your use cases. Um, the biggest problem that people were having 
was that different manufacturers actually collected different kinds of data. So, you know, yes. to, to oversimplify, you know, uh, so, you know, one tractor manufacturer might be actually measuring the, the, the moisture within the soil. Another one, you know, might be measuring ambient dew points, uh, you know. Uh, and, and I guess my question to you is, what do you do about that? <laughs> um, yes, it's 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 a very difficult, uh, it, it, it's a challenging situation, and and not only that, but what you're what you're alluding to um, is 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 the concept of digital twins being different, um, and of course then you get into fragmentation of digital twins and questions of who owns that data. Um, so as a farmer operating that tractor, is is that my data, or is that the that does that data belong to the vendor of the, of the tractor, and how do I get access to it? Um, so, so, I, so I think there's a combination of things. <laughs> Digital twins that are so not think, identical, as it were. <laughs> Well, well, they're not identical. They're, they're not identical between between different assets, and and they can actually differ for the same asset being used for different processes. Um, so, so you might have one digital twin of a tractor from for, in, 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 to, you know, to support your smart agriculture solution, um, and another digital twin to support servicing of the tractor. Um, yeah. And, and questions of who owns them. So it's an incredibly complicated area, and, and I think there is some level of creeping standardization uh, of digital twins that will happen at an industry level. So I think there will become a standardized way effectively of measuring those, that, that moisture, uh, those moisture levels. And I think that vendors of tractors will Will, will offer a, will support APIs to pull out that information. Um, and I think that longer term, there will be more clarity about who actually owns the digital twin information. Um, and I think ultimately, ultimately, it'll be owned by the owner of the asset who will then allow or authorize other people in a, in a kind of a vendor constellation to access that information. Um, but it's, it's quite a you rightly identified a very challenging situation there. Yeah, I, you know, I, thanks so much, Jim. Really appreciate your time this morning. You really uh, laid it out how, how complex these things can be. And uh, uh, Jim Morris, certainly uh, with a new company, Transformer Insights, but equally as, as certain not new to the IT sector. Jim, uh, welcome back, and uh, thanks so much for your time. Thank you. Thank you. And with that, uh, I thank uh, all of our speakers and, indeed, all of our audience members. Uh, really hope everyone is staying safe and well. And please join us next week where we'll be diving into connectivity uh, in the industrial Internet of Things. Uh, that starts uh, on Thursday, October 1st uh, at 10 o'clock in the morning, U.S. East Coast time. Look forward to seeing everyone then. Thanks so much, and take care.